The Great King, Day 6. The Great King. Will went slowly across the slope towards Bram. It was a gray day now. The rain had fallen all night, and there was more to come. The sky was lowering, ominous, and all the mountains were lost in ragged cloud. Will thought, the breath of the bread and the wind. He saw Bran beginning to climb away up the hill, diagonally in an obvious effort to avoid him. Will paused and decided to give up. A ridiculous game of dodging across the mountain would do no one any good, and besides, the harp had to be taken to a safe place. He set off through the wet rock and on the long muddy walk to the far side of Caradoc Pritchard's farm. His trousers were already soaked, in spite of Wellington's boots borrowed from Aunt Jen. Partway he crossed the land that had been swept up by the fire, and a thin mud of black ash clung to his boots. Will strode along moodily. He glanced round now, and then in case the Caradoc Pritchard were about, but the fields were deserted and oddly silent. No birds sang today. Even the sheep seemed quiet, and there was a, seldom the sound of a car drifting from the valley road. It was as if <clears throat> all the Grey Valley waited for something. Will tried to sense the mood of the place more accurately, but all the time now his mind was gradually filling again with the intimacy of the Grey King, growing, growing, a whisper grown to a call, soon to grow to a furious shout. It was difficult to find attention for much else. He came to the slate roof shelter where he had hidden the, sh the harp among the stacked bales of hay. The force of his own spell brought him up standing, ten feet away, as though he had walked into a glass wall. Will smiled. Then, to break the enchantment in the way appointed, he began very softly to sing. It was a spell song of the old speech, and its words were not like the words of human speech, but more indefinite, a matter of nuance of the sound. He was a good singer, well taught, and the high, clear notes flowed softly through the gloomy air like rays of light. Will felt the force of the resisting spell melt away. He came to the end of the verse. Caradoc Pritchard's voice said coldly behind him, Proper little nightingale, isn't it? Will froze. He turned slowly and stood in silence, looking at Pritchard's pasty, full-cheeked face, with its crooked, crooked nose and eyes bright as black currants. Well, Pritchard said impatiently, what do you think you are doing here, standing in the middle of my field, singing to the hedge? Are you mad, boy? Will gaped, changing his face su suddenly to an expression of total foolishness. It was the song. I just thought of it. I wanted to try it out. They say you're a poet. You ought to understand. He let his voice drop conspiratorially. I write songs sometimes, you see, but please don't tell anyone. They always laugh. They think it's stupid. Pritchard said, your uncle? Everyone at home. Pritchard squintered at him suspiciously. The proud word poet had made its effect, but he was not the kind of man to relax unwarily for, or for long. He said contemptuously, Oh, the English, they know nothing of music. I am not surprised. Clods, they are. You have a very good voice for an English boy. Then his voice sharpened suddenly. But you weren't singing English, were you? No, Will said. What then? Will beamed at him confidently. Nothing, r really. They were just nonsense words that they seemed to go with the tune. You know. But the fish did not bite. Pritchard's eyes narrowed. He looked in a quick nervous movement up the valley towards the mountains and then back at Will. He said abruptly, I don't like you, English boy. Something funny about you there is. All this about songs and singing does not explain why you're standing here on my land. Taking a shortcut, that's all, Will said. I wasn't hurting anything, honestly. Shortcut, is it? From where to where? Your uncle's land is all over there, where you came from, and nothing is on the other side of us except moor and mountain. Nothing for you. Go back to a quid, and you can get off back to your sniveling little friend who lost his dog. Off. Off out there. Out of here. All at once he was shouting, the pudgy-faced dusky red. Get out. Get out. Will sighed. There was only one thing to be done. He had not wanted to risk attracting the closer attention of the gray king, but it was impossible to leave the harp vulnerable to Caradoc Richard's eye. The man was glaring at him now, clenching his fist in a fit of the same unaccountable vicious rage that Will had seen overtake him before. Get out, I tell you. There in the open field under the still gray sky, Will stretched out one arm, with all five fingers stiff and pointing, and said a single quiet word. And Caradoc Pritchard was caught out of time, immobile, and his mouth half, half open and his hand raised pointing, his face frozen in exactly the same ugly anger that had twisted it when he shot the dog to fall. It was a pity, Will thought bitterly, that he could not be left that way forever. <clears throat> but no spell lasts forever, and most for only a short breath of time. Quickly, Will went forward to the stone shelter, reached in between the bales of hay, and pulled out the gleaming little golden harp. One corner of its frame was caught on an old tattered sack left among the bales. Impatiently, he tugged both harp and sacking free, bundled them together under his arm. Then he moved round to stand behind Caradoc Pritchard. Once more, he pointed a stiff-fingered hand at him and spoke a single word, and Caradoc Pritchard, as if he had never intended to do anything else, plodded off across the field towards his farmhouse without once turning around. When he arrived there, Will knew he would be convinced that he had gone straight home from the day's work, and he would not have an ounce of memory of Will Stanton standing in a field singing to the sky. The plodding, paunchy form disappeared over the stile at the end of the field. Will untangled the old sack from the harp's intricate golden frame. It was about to toss it aside when he realized how useful it would be as a covering. A nameless bundle under his arm could be explained 
explained away if he should meet someone rather than rather more easily than a gleaming and obviously priceless golden harp as he slid the harp carefully inside the sack wrinkling his nose at the hay dust puffing out a movement across the field caught his eye he glanced up and for a moment even the harp left his mind it was the great gray fox king of the milgwin creature of the bread and the wind loping fast along the hedge in sudden furious hatred will flung out one pointing arm and shouted a word to stop it and the big gray animal no longer on its master's land tumbled backwards in mid-stride as if it had been snatched up by a sudden tremendous high wind Picking itself up, it stood staring at Will, red tongue rolling. Then it lifted its long muzzle and gave one low howl, like a dog in trouble. It's no good calling, said Will under his breath. You can just stand there till I decide what to do with you. But then involuntarily he shivered. The air seemed suddenly colder, and across the fields all around him he could see creeping in a low ground mist that he had not noticed before. Slowly it came pouring over the fence, fences, re <coughs> relentless like some huge crawling creature. From every direction it came, from the mountain, the valley, the lower slopes, and when Will looked back at the gray fox standing stiff-legged in the field, he saw something else that gave a chill, uh, a new terror to the mist. The fox was changing color with every good, every moment as he watched it. Its sleek body and bushy tail grew darker and darker until it became almost black. Will stared, frowning. He thought it irre irrelevantly. It looks just like Penn, and instantly he caught his breath, realizing something that was not irrelevant at all. That it was John Rowland's dog, Penn, who, with Gaffal, had been accused by Caradog Pritchard of the sheep attacks made in reality by the foxes of the Grey King. Something immeasurably strong was pushing him against him, breaking his own enchantment. Whilst Will stood for a moment, confused and powerless, the big fox, now black as coal, gave its strange, small, ex exultant leap into the air, grinned deliberately at him, and was off, running swiftly across the field. It vanished through the far hedge in the direction that Caradoc Pritchard had taken towards his farm. Will knew exactly what was likely to happen when it got there, and there was nothing he could do. He was held back by the power of the Great King, and reluctantly now he was facing an idea to which he had not given a thought before, the possibility that this power, much greater than his own, was in fact so great that he might not might never be able to accomplish his allotted quest. Setting his teeth, he gripped the shrouded harp beneath his arm and set off across the field towards Clovid Farm. Carefully, he slipped under the barbed wire edging the field, <clears throat> across the corner of the next, clambered over the stile leading into the lane, but all the time his steps grew slower and slower, his breathing more labored. Somehow, there beneath his arm, the harp was growing heavier and heavier until he could scarcely move for the weight of it. He knew that it was not a matter of his own weakness. Against his resistance, some great enchantment was giving <coughs> to the precious thing of power in his arm a heaviness impossible for any human strength to support. Clutching at the harp, he grasped with pain at its impossible weight and sank down with it to the ground. As he crossed there, he raised his head and saw that the mist swirled everywhere around him now. All the world was gray-white, featureless. He stared into the mist, a grad and gradually the mist took shape. The figure was so huge that at first he could not realize it was there. It stretched wider than the field and high into the sky. It had shape, but not recognizable earthly shape. Will could see its outline from the corner of his eye, but when he looked directly at any part of it, there was nothing there. Yet the, there the figure loomed before him, immense and terrible, and he knew that it was a being of great power than anything he had ever encountered in his life before. Of all the great lords of the dark, nothing, none was singly more powerful and dangerous than the great king. But because he had remained always from the beginning of time in his fastness among the Cater Idris peaks, never descending to the valley or lower slopes, none of the old ones had ever encountered him to learn what force he had at his command. So now Will alone, last and least of the old ones, faced him with no defense but the inborn magic and the light in his own wits. A voice came from the misty shape, both sweet and terrible. It filled the air like the mist itself, and Will could not tell what language it spoke, nor whether it spoke to the hearing of the ears. He knew only that the things it said were instantly in his own mind. You may not wake the sleepers, old one, said the voice. I will prevent you. This is my land, and in it they shall sleep forever. And as they have slept these many centuries, your harp shall not wake them. I will prevent you. Well sat in a small crumpled heap, his arms across the harp he could no longer hold. It is my quest, he said. You know that I must follow it. Go back, said the voice, blowing through his mind like the wind. Go back, take the harp safely with you. A thing of power for the light and your masters. I shall let you go if you go back now and leave my hand. You have won that much. The voice grew harder, more chill in the mist. But if you seek the sleepers, I shall destroy you and the golden harp as well. No, Will said. I am of the light. You cannot destroy me. It will not differ greatly from destruction, the voice said. Come now, you know that, old one. It grew softer, more sibilant, and nasty, as if ca caressing an evil thought. Will suddenly remembered the Lord in the sky blue robe. The powers of the dark and the light are equal in force, but we differ a little in our treatment of those we may bring under our will. 
voice crawled like a slug over Will's skin. Go back, old one. I shall not warn the light again. Summoning all his confidence, Will scrambled up, leaving the harp on the ground at his feet. He made a mocking little bow to the great mistiness that he knew. Now he must not look at directly. You have given your warning, Majesty, he said, and I have heard it. But it will make no difference. The dark can never turn the mind of the light, nor may it hinder the taking of a thing of power, once it has been rightly claimed. <coughs> Take your spell off the golden harp. You have no right to touch it with enchantment. The mist swirled darker. The voice grew colder and more remote. The harp is now spellbound, old one. Take it from the sack. Will bent down. He tried once more to pick up the sack, wrapped, sacking wrapped harp, but it would not move. It might have been a rock rooted deep in the land. Then he pulled the sacking aside to uncover the harp and took it up, and the shining gold thing came into his hand as lightly as it ever had. He looked down at the sack. There is something else there. Of course, said the great king. Will ripped a half hearted sacking so that it lay open. It still seemed quite empty, as it had from the first. Then he noticed in one fold a small, highly polished white stone, no bigger than a pebble. He bent to pick it up. It would not move. He said slowly, It's a wear stone. Yes, the voice said. Your wear stone, a channel for the dark, so that when it is left in a certain place, you may know all that is happening in that place, and may put into it your will to make other things happen. It was hidden in that old sack all the time. A sudden memory flickered in his mind. No wonder I lost my hold on the fox of the mill wind. Out of the mist, laughter came. It was a terrifying sound like the first rattle of an avalanche. Then it said, oh, and worse, the voice came whispering, A wearstone of the dark has no value for the light. Give it to me. You had it put on Caradog Pritchard's farm, Will said. Why? He is your creature anyway. You have no need of a wearstone for him. That fool is none of mine, the great king said contemptuously. If the dark showed itself to him, he would melt with fear like butter in the sun. No, he is not of the dark, but he is very useful. A man so wrapped in his own ill will is a gift to the dark from the earth. It is so easy to give him suitable ideas. Very useful indeed. Will said quietly, There are such men of an opposite kind who are unwittingly served the light too. Ah, said the voice slyly, but not so many, old one. Not so many, I think. It sharpened again, and the mist swirled colder. Give me the wearstone. It will not work against you, but neither will it work for you. It will always cleave to the earth at the touch of the light, as would a wearstone of yours, if you had one, at my touch. I have no need of one, Will said. Certainly no need of yours. Take it. Stand away. I shall take it and be gone. And if in one night and one day you are not also gone from, my, from this my land, you will cease to exist by the standards of men. Old one, you shall not hinder us, not with your six signs nor your harp of gold. The voice rose and swelled suddenly like a high wind, for our time has almost come in spite of you, and the dark is rising. The dark is rising. The words roared through Will's mind as the mist swirled dark and chill round his face, obscuring everything, even the ground beneath his feet. He could no longer see the harp, but only feel it clutched close in both his arms. He staggered giddily, and a terrible chill struck into all the length of his body. Then it was gone, and he stood in the lane between the hedges with the harp clasped to his chest, and the valley was clear... <coughs> all about him under the gray sky, and at his feet an empty piece of old sacking lay. Shakily Will bent and wrapped the harp again and set off for Cluid Farm. He slipped upstairs to his room to hide the harp, calling a gr greeting to Aunt Jen. She called back over her shoulder without turning, stirring a pot carefully at the stove. But when Will came downstairs again, the big kitchen seemed full of people. His uncle and Riz were roving restlessly about, faces taut with concern. John Rollins had just come through the door. Did you see him? Riz burst out anxiously to Rollins. John Rollins' weather-lined brown face gained a few extra lines as the eyebrows rose. Who, sh who should I have seen? David Evans pulled out a chair and dropped wearily into it. He sighed. Caradog Pritchard was outside just now. There's no end to his madness. He claims that another of his sheep was worried by a dog this afternoon. Killed this one. He says that it happened right there in his yard again, and that he and his wife saw everything, and he swears up and down that it was the dog the, that the dog was Penn. Waving his gun about, he was the dang lunatic, Riz said angrily. He would have shot the dog for sure if you and Penn had been, been here. Thank God you are not. John Rowland said mildly, I'm surprised he was not waiting for us at the gate. I told him you were out late on the mountain after some ewes, said Will's uncle. His neat head bent, despondent. No doubt the fool will be out there looking for you. Shoot a sheep, you will. I shouldn't be surprised, John Rowland said, if he can find the black ewe, that is. But David Evans was too shaken to smile. Let him do that, and I will have him off to Twin Police Station. Dogs or no dogs. I don't like it, John Rowland. The man is acting as if, I don't know, I really think that his wits have begun to turn. Raving, he was. Dogs killing sheep is a bad thing, heaven knows. But he was acting as well as if it was children had been killed, if he had had children. I think it is as well as we he has not. Penn has been with me all day, without a break, John Rowland said, his deep voice tranquil. Of course he has, said Riz. 
But Caradoc Pritchard would not believe that even if he had watched you every minute of the day with his own eyes. He is that bad, and he will be back tomorrow. There is no doubt at all. Perhaps Betty Pritchard will be able to talk, make him see reason before then, Aunt Jen said. Though she has never had much luck before, goodness knows. He must be a hard man to be married to, that one. John Rollins looked at Will's uncle. What shall we do? I don't know, David Evans said, shaking his head morosely. What do you think? <clears throat> well, John Rollins said, I was thinking that if you are not using the Land Rover in the morning, I might go very early up the valley and leave Penn for a few days with Idris Jones Tybalt. Will's uncle lifted his head, his face brightening for the first time. Good, very good. Jones Tabant owes you a favor for borrowing a tractor this summer. He's a good fellow anyway, and one of his dogs is from the same litter as Penn. That is a very good idea, Riss says simply, and we are out of plugs for the chainsaw. You can pick pick one up in the Abergenoian coming back. Rollins laughed. All settled then? Mr. Rollins, Mr. Rollins, Will said. Can I come too? They had not noticed he was there, heads turned in surprise to where he stood on the stairs. Come and welcome. John Rowan said. That would be nice, Aunt Jen said. I was just thinking yesterday that we hadn't taken you to Tal Wailin yet. That's the lake up there. Idris Jones's farm is right next to it. Caradoc Pritchard will not dream that the dog might be there, said David Evans. It will give him time to cool off. And if the sheep killing goes on, Riz said deliberately, he left the sentence hanging. There's a thought now, Will's aunt said. We must make sure Caradoc thinks Penn is still here. Then if he sees Penn with his own eyes, savage a sheep again tomorrow, there will be a quick answer for him. Good then, John Owen said. Penn is at home having his supper. I think I will go and join him. We will leave at 5.30, Will. Caradoc Pritchard is not the earliest riser in the world. Perhaps young Bran would like to go with you, being a Saturday, said David Evans, leaning back, relaxed now in his chair. I don't think so, Will said. A pleasant lake. Will expected to be the only one stirring in the house at 5 in the morning, but his aunt Jen was up before him. She gave him a cup of tea and a big slab of homemade bread and butter. Cold out there early, she said. You'll do better with something inside you. Bread and butter tastes five times as good here as anywhere else, said Will. Glancing up as he chewed, he saw her watching him with a funny, wry half-smile. The picture of health you are, she said, just like your big brother Ste Stephen, or Stephen at your age. Nobody would guess how ill you were, not so, not so long ago. But my goodness me, it's not exactly a rest cure we've been giving you. The fire and all this business with the sheep killing... Exciting, said Will, muffled through a mouthful. Well, yes, said Aunt Jen. Indeed, in a place where nothing out of the ordinary ever happens, usually from one year's end to the next. I think I have had enough excitement to be getting along with for now. Will said lightly, deliberately. I suppose the last real stir was when Bran's mother came. Ah, his aunt said. Her pleasant, cozy face was unreadable. You've heard about that, have you? I suppose John Rollins told you. He's a kind soul, Shoni Maher. No, no doubt he had his reasons. Tell me, Will, have you had some sort of quarrel with Bran? Will thought, and that's what you wanted to ask me, with a cup of tea, because you are a kind soul, too, and can feel Bran's distress, and I wish I could be properly honest with you. No, he said, but losing Kafal has been so bad for him that I think he just wants to be alone for a while. Poor lad, she shook her head. Be patient with him. He's a lonely boy and had a strange life in some ways. It's been wonderful for him having you here until his, this spoiled everything. A small pain shot through Will's forearm. He clutched it and found it came from the scar on the light. His burn his burned-in brand. He said suddenly, Did she ever come back at all? Ever, Aunt Jen? Bran's mother? How could she just go off and leave him like that? I don't know, his aunt said. But no, there was no sign of her ever again. In one minute, to go away forever. I think that must bother Bran a lot. She looked at him sharply. Has he ever said anything about it? Oh, no, of course not. We've never talked about that. I just felt, I'm just sure it must bother him underneath. You're a funny boy yourself, said his aunt curiously. Sometimes you sound like an old man. Comes from having so many brothers and sisters older than you, I suppose. <clears throat> Perhaps you understand Bran better than most boys could. She hesitated for a moment and drew her, her chair closer. I will tell you something, she said, in case it might help Bran. I know you have sense enough not to tell him about it. I think when his mother had some great trouble in her life past that she could not, that she could do nothing about, and that because of that she felt she had to give Bran a life that would be free of it. She knew Owen Davies was a good man and would look after the boy, but she also knew that she simply did not love Owen as deeply as he loved her, not enough to marry him. When things turned out like that, there is nothing a woman can do. It is kindest to go away, she paused. Not kind to leave Bran, you might say. That was just exactly what I was going to say, said Will. Well, said his aunt, Gwen said something to me in those few days she was here, when we were alone once. I have never talked about it, but I have never forgotten. She said, if you have once betrayed a great trust, you dare not let yourself be trusted again, because a second betrayal 
would be the end of the world. I don't know if you can understand that. You mean she was frightened of what she might do? And more frightened of what she has done, whatever it was. So she ran away, poor Gran. I said, well, poor Owen Davies, said his aunt. There was a gentle knock at the door, and John Rollins put his head inside. Borda, he said. Ready, Will? Borda, John, said Aunt Jen, smiling at him. Pulling on his jacket, Will turned suddenly and gave her a clumsy hug. Thank you, Aunt Jen. The smile brightened with pleasure and surprise. <coughs> we'll see you when you when we see you, she said. <coughs> John Rowland said as he started the car outside the farm. Fond of you, your auntie. Will held open the door for Pen to scramble up. The dog jumped over the seat in the back and lay docile on the floor. I'm fond of her, too, very. So is my mom. Be careful, then, won't you, John Rowland's, uh, Rowland said. He said. His seamed brown face was innocent of all expression, but the words had forced. Had forced. He looked at Will rather coldly. What do you mean? Well, Roland said, carefully turning the Land Rover into the road, I am not at all sure what it is that is going on all around us, Will Bach, or where it is leading. But those men who know anything at all about the light also know that there is a fierceness to its power, like the bare sword of the law, or the white burning of the sun. Suddenly his voice sounded to Will very strong and very Welsh. At the very heart, that is. Other things like humanity and mercy and charity that most good men hold precious than all else. They do not come first for the light. Oh, sometimes they are, often indeed. But in the very long run, the concern of you people is with the absolute good ahead of all else. You are like fanatics, your masters at any rate, like the old crusaders. Oh, like certain groups in every belief, though this is not a matter of religion, of course. At the center of the light, there is a cold white flame, just as at the center of the dark, there is a great black pit bottomless as the universe. His warm, deep voice ended, and there was only the roar of the engine. Will looked out over the gray misted field, silent. There was a great long speech now, John Rowland said awkwardly, but I was only saying, be careful not to forget that there are people in this valley who can be hurt, even in the pursuit of good ends. Will heard again in his mind, and Brand's anguished cry as the dog could fall was shot dead, and heard his cold dismissal. Go away, go away. And for a second, another image, unexpected, flashed into his mind out of the past. The strong, bony face of Merriman and his master, first of the old ones, cold in judgment of a much-loved figure who, through the frailty of being no more than a man, had once betrayed the cause of the light. He sighed. I understand what you are saying, he said sadly, but you misjudge us, because you are a man <clears throat> yourself. For us, there is only the destiny, like a job to be done. We are here simply to save the world from the dark. Make no mistake, John. The dark is rising, and will take the world to itself very soon if nothing stands in its way. And if that should happen, then there should be no question ever for anyone, either of warm charity or of cold, absolute good. Because nothing would exist in the world or in the hearts of men except the bottomless black pit. The charity and the mercy and the humanitarianism are for you, and they are the <coughs> only things in which men are able to exist together in peace. But in this hard case that we the lights are in, confronting the dark, we can make no use of them. We are fighting a war. We are fighting for death, life or death. Not for our life, remember, since we cannot die. For yours. He reached his hand behind him over the back of the seat and pen licked it with his floppy wet tongue. Sometimes, Will said slowly, in this sort of war, it is not possible to pause, to smooth, the way for one human being, because even that one small thing could mean an end of the world for all the rest. A fine rain began to mist the windscreen. John Rollins turned on the wipers, peering forward at the gray world as he drove. He said, It is a cold world you live in, Bakken. I do not think so far ahead myself. I would take the one human being over all the principal, all the time. Will slumped down low in his seat, curling into a ball and pulling up his knees. Oh, so would I, he said sadly. So would I if I could. It would feel a lot better inside me, but it wouldn't work. Behind them, Penn leapt unexpectedly to his feet, barking. Will uncoiled. Like a startled snake, John Rollins braked sharply, half turning and spoke swift and low to the dog and the Welsh. But still Penn stood in the back of the Land Rover, stiff as a stuffed dog, barking fiercely, and in the next moment, as if he were observing something outside himself, Will felt his own body jerk stiff as he felt the same force. His fingernails drove into the palms of his hands. John Rollins did not stop the car, though he had moved to a, to a crawl. He gave one sharp look out of his re near window at the moorland through the mist and accelerated again. In a moment or two, Will felt the tension go out of his limbs and sat back gasping. The dog, too, stopped barking, and in the sudden loud silence, lay down meekly on the floor as if he had never moved at all. Roland said with a tightness in his deep voice, We have just come past the cottage, the empty cottage, where we lost the sheep. Will said nothing. His breath was coming fast and shallow as it had when he first came out of the worst of his illness, and he his hunched his shoulders and bent his head beneath the fierce weight of the power of the gray cane. John Rollins drove faster, pulling the tough little car round blind, slated wall turns. 
The road curved across the valley, great new slopes rose on its eastern side, swooping up into the sky, bare and gray, treacherous with screed. Everywhere they loomed over the gentle green fields, dominant, menacing. And then at last there were signs of side roads and scattered gray slated roof houses. And before them, as Roland slowed for a crossroad, Will saw the lake of Cal Lyrin. <clears throat> His aunts had called it the loveliest lake in Wales, but lying dark there in the gray morning, it was more sinister than lovely. On its black, still surface, not a ripple stirred. It filled the valley floor. Above it reared the first slopes of Cater Idris, the mountain of the great king, and beyond, at the far end of the valley, a pass led through the hills, away, Will felt, toward the ends of the world. He had himself under control now, but he could feel the tension quivering in his mind. The great king had felt his coming, and the awareness of his angry hostility was as clear as if it were shouted aloud. Will knew that it could not be long before one of the watchers, a peregrine curving high over the slopes, would catch clear sight of him. He did not know what would happen then. John Rollins turned the land rover down a rough track, away from the lake, and before long they came to a farm tucked beneath the lowest slopes of Cater Idris. Will jumped out to open and close the gate, and as he trudged up into the farmyard, he saw a small man in a flat cap come out of the house to greet the car. Dogs were barking. He could see one of them waiting a little way off where the farmer had left it, a sheepdog, a little smaller than Penn, but with exactly the same black coat and the splash of white under the chin. Rollins broke off an animated Welsh conversation as Will came up to them. Idris, this is a new helper I have, David Evans' nephew, Will, from England. How do you do, Mr. Jones? Will said, Idris Jones, Tabant twinkled at him as they shook hands. He had enormous, rather prominent dark eyes that made him look disconcertingly like a bush baby. How are you, Will? I hear you have been having fun with our friend Caradoc Pritchard. We all have, John Rowan said grimly. He gave a whistle over his shoulder and Penn leapt out of the car, glancing up as if seeking permission to leave and trotted off to greet the other black dog. They circled another amiably without barking. Lala, there is a sister, believe it or not, Idris Jones said to Will. Came from the same litter they did. Over the last way. That's a while ago, eh, John? Come along come along inside now. Megan has just made the tea. In a warm kitchen with stout, smiling Mrs. Jones, who was almost twice the size of her neat husband, the smell of frying bacon made Will ravenous all over again. He filled himself happily with two fried eggs, slick thick slices of homemade home cured bacon, and hot flat Welsh cakes, like miniature pancakes flecked with currants. Mrs. Jones began instantly chattering away to John Rollins in a contented flow of Welsh, scarcely ever seeming to draw breath, or to give way to a phrase or two in her husband's light voice, or Rollins' deep rumble. Clearly, she was enjoying relaying all the local gossip, gossip and collecting any that might emanate from Clwyd. <clears throat> Will, full of bacon and well-being, had almost stopped paying attention when he saw John Rollins listening, <clears throat> give a sudden start and sit for forward, taking his pipe out of his mouth. Rollins said in English, Up over the lake, did you say, Idris? That's right, Farmer Jones said, dutifully watching, <coughs> switching languages with a quick smile at Will. Up on a ledge. I didn't have a chance to get too close, being in a hurry after my own sheep, but I am almost sure it was a pentriff you. Not d dead very long. I think the birds had not been at it enough, maybe a day or two. What interested me was the blood on the neck. Quite old. It was very dark, must have been on the fleece a lot longer than the sheep had been dead. And for a sheep that must have been already wounded, that a slope was... A uh, heck of a funny place to go. Well, I'll show you later. Will and John Rollins looked at one another. You think it's that sheep, Will said, the one that vanished? I think it may be, John Rollins said. But later, when Andrews Jones took them to the to see the ewe, he would not let Will come close enough to see. <clears throat> not a nice sight, Bakken, he said, looking doubtfully at Will and re resettling the cap on his head. A sheep, when the ravens have been added for a day or two, is a bit of a mess. If you're not accustomed to it, Wait here a minute or two. We'll be straight back. All right, Will said, resigned. But as the two men went on up the steep, slippery mountainside, he sat hastily down in a sudden fit of giddiness and knew that it certainly would not have been a good idea for him to have gone further on. They were on a slope rising above the lake, a broad, unprotected sweep of scree and poor grass broken by ledges and outcrops of granite. Further down the valley of the mountain was, <coughs> was clothed in dark forests of spruce trees, but here the land is bare, inhospitable. The dead sheep lay on a ledge that seemed to Will totally inaccessible, high above his head. It jutted out of the mountain, and the pathetic white heap lying on, on it was not visible from where he sat now. Nor could he see John Rollins and Idris Jones climbing higher with the two black dogs. Two hundred feet below lay the lake, its stillness broken only by a small dinging moving lazily out from the small angler's hotel that nestled beneath the mountains at the opposite side. 
Will could see no other sign of life anywhere on the rest of the lake and on either side of the valley. <clears throat> the land seemed gentler now, with subtle color everywhere, for the sun was breaking out fitfully between scuttling clouds. The, then there was a scuffling and stumbling above him, and John Rollins came down the steep slope, planting his heels firmly in the shale lying loose in the thin grass. It was Jones and the dogs followed. Rollins' lined face was bleak. He said, That is the same you, all right, Will, but how... She could have got out of the cottage and up here is just beyond me. It makes no sense at all. He glanced over his shoulder at Idris Jones, who was shaking his bird-like head in distress. Nor to Idris, either. I've been telling him the story. Oh, Will said sadly, without bothering now to dissemble. It was not very complicated, really. The milkwood mil took her. He saw from the corner of his eye that Idris Jones' Taibant stood <coughs> suddenly very still up on the slope, staring at him. Avoiding the farmer's eye, <coughs> he sat there, hugging his knees against his chest, and looked at John Rollins unguardedly for the first time, with the eyes not of a boy, but of an old one. Time was growing short, and he was tired of pre pretense. The king of the Milgwin, he said, the chief of the foxes of the Brenham Wid. He's the biggest of all of them, and the most powerful, and his master has given him the way of doing many things. He is no more than a creature still, but he is not at all ordinary. For instance, he is now at this moment just exactly the color of pen, so that it would be hard for any man who, with his own eyes, saw him attacking a sheep not to think for certain that it was pen he was seeing attack the sheep. John Rollins was gazing at him, his dark eyes bright as polished stone. He said slowly, It may be before that he might have been just exactly the color of Kafal, so that anyone else might have thought, Yes, Will said, they might. Rollins shook his head abruptly as if to cast a weight from it. I think it is time we went down off this mountain and just boy. He said, <clears throat> firmly heaving Will to his feet. Yes, said Andrew Stone hastily. Yes, yes. He followed them, looking totally bemused, as if he had just heard a sheep bark like a dog and were trying to find a way, believing what he had heard. The dogs had trotted ahead of them, turning protectively now and then to make sure they followed. John Rollins very soon re released Will to walk alone, for single file was the only possible way down the winding steep path, made by the sheep and seldom used by men. Will was halfway down to the lake before he fell. He could never explain the afterwards how he had come to stumble. He could only have said very simply that the mountain shrugged, and even John Rollins in the height of trustfulness could not have been expected to believe that. Nevertheless, the mountain did shrug through the malice of its master, the Brennan Wood, so that a piece of the path beneath Will's feet jumped perceptibly to one side and back again like a cat humping its back. And Will saw with saw it with sick horror only in the moment that he lost his balance and went rolling down. He heard the men shout and was aware of a flurry of movement as Rollins dived to grab him. But he was already rolling, tumbling, as it was only a ledge of granite jutting as the ledge on which he had found the dead sheep that caught him from rolling the full hundred-foot drop down to the edge of the lake. He came to a great thud against the jagged shelf of rock and cried out in pain as a shaft of fire seemed to shoot blazing up his left arm. But the rock had saved him. He lay still. Gentle as a mother general once felt along the bone of his arm. His face was a strange color where the blood had drained away beneath the tan. Hey, he said huskily. You are a lucky one, Will Stanton. That is going to hurt a good deal for the next few days, but it is not broken anywhere so far as I can tell. And it might be well, might well have been in smithereens. And the boy at the bottom of the linen <coughs> in Wingill, Idris Jones said shakily, straightening up and trying to recover his lost breath. How the devil did you manage to fall like that, Bakken? We were not going so very fast at all, but such a speed you went down. He whistled softly, took off his cap to wipe his brow. Gently does it, said John Rollins, putting Will carefully back on his feet. <clears throat> Are you all all right to walk now? Not hurt anywhere else? I shall be okay, honestly. Thank you. Will was trying to look around at Idris Jones. Mrs. Jones, what was that you called the lake? Jones looked at him blankly. What? You said the boy might have been at the bottom of the lake, didn't you? But you didn't say Talwai Lin. You called it by some other name. Lynn, something else. Lynn <clears throat> Wingill. That is a pro its proper name, the old Welsh name. Jones was looking at him in a kind of dazed wonder, clearly suspecting the fall had knocked Will in the head. He added absently, It is a nice name, but not much used these days, even on the ordnance survey. It, like Bala, too. Now, <clears throat> now that should be the Lynn to get, as it always was. But they do not know more now anywhere they <clears throat> than call it Bala Lake. Will said, Lynn Wingill. When Gill, what does it mean in English? Well, the lake in the pleasant place, pleasant retreat, whatever. The pleasant lake, Will said. No wonder I fell. The pleasant lake. 
Yes, you could put it that way, loosely, I, I suppose. Idris Jones collected his wits suddenly and turned in baffled anguish. John Rollins, what is the matter with this mad boy you have found? Standing up here talking semantics on a mountain when he has just come to close to breaking, breaking his neck. Get him down to the farm before he falls down in a fit and starts speaking with tongues. John Rowan's deep chuckle had relief in it. Come on, Will. Plump Mr. Jones clucked over Will in concern and put a cold comp compress on his forearm. Nobody would hear of his doing anything or going anywhere. The patchy sunshine was warmer now, and Will found it not unpleasant at all to lie on his back in the grass near the farmhouse with Penn's cold nose pushing at his ear and watch the clouds scud across the pale blue sky. John Rowan's decided that he would go to Abergavim, Nearby to fetch the spark plug, Riz wanted from the garage there. Idris Jones discovered errands that meant he should go too. They both both announced firmly that Will should stay with Mrs. Jones and the dogs and rest. He felt that they were still recovering from his fall themselves, treating him as a fragile piece of china, which, since it had magically survived without breakage, should be set carefully on a shelf and not moved for a special conciliatory length of time. The Land Rover chugged away with the wet the two men. Mrs. Jones fussed amiably to and fro until she had satisfied herself that Will was not in pain or any distress, and then went off and settled to pastry making in her kitchen. For a while, Will sat playly, playing idly with the dogs, thinking of the great king in a mixture of brief triumph, resentment, belligerence, and nervousness of what might be going to happen next. For there was no escape now. He had known it, somehow, even <coughs> when they had left that morning. His way lay firmly on into the middle of the heartland of the bread and the wind. By the pleasant lake the sleepers lie, on Cadvin's way where the kestrels call. It had never occurred to him to follow the simplest route out of the conundrum and go out and walk along Cadvin's way until it led him to a lake. But there would have been no difference in the end. Sooner or later he would have come here to Talwai Lynn, Lynn Wingill, the lake and the pleasant place under the shadow of the Grey King. Taking Penn with him and leaving a patient resigned Lala behind, he strolled beyond the farm gate and out down the slated fence lane. A few late blackberries hung down over the grassy bank, and a woodlark sang behind the fence. It might also have been summer, but though the sun shone in the distance over the brambles, Will could see mist round Cater Idris's peaks. He was in a dreamy, suspended state of mind, due partly to the aspirin Mrs. Jones had made him take for the pain in his arm, when all at once he saw a boy come hurtling down the lane towards him on a bicycle. Will jumped to one side. There was a squealing of brakes, a flurry of kicked-up slate dust, and the boy collapsed in a pile of legs and spinning wheels on the other side of the lane. His cap tumbled off, and Will saw the white hair. It was Bran. His face was damp with sweat, his shirt clung stickily to his chest, and his breath came in great gulps. He had no time for greeting or explanation. Will, Penn, get him away from here. Hide him. Dog Pritchard found out. He's coming. He is as mad as a hatter. He swears he's going to kill Penn, whatever, and he's on his way here now with his gun.